culture came into uh, the West because of the loss of the East. So Venice is trading and this is the source of all of its wealth. The huge turning point, the date we all know, 1492, Columbus, and not long after, making their way all around the world with Magellan and the end of the uh, overland routes because of all these spices, the silks, all of the, the wealth of the East coming over land and then being um, loaded onto these ships at Constantinople uh, in these cities of the East, Palestine and so on, and making their way to Venice. Venice is, a, a as, I, as I showed you here, it's a bunch of uh, islands in the middle of a lagoon. It uh, existed because people had escaped uh, the ravages of the fall of the, the Western Empire. Um, so Venice has no connection in that sense to the glorious Roman past, like, like a place like Rome full of the Roman ruins. There was no Venice in ancient Rome. Venice was a refuge. It was a bunch of islands where the people took refuge from the predations of, of um, barbarians and so on. So their survival becomes trade, shipping. And they are the great maritime republic, which ultimately, of course, comes inland. So that's a little bit of the historic uh, outline of where we are. And these years when Carpaccio is painting are years of war with the Sultan and the, uh, the, uh, the Ottomans. So the Dalmatian school, you can see here a, a photo of it. Uh, it looks, in fact, like a little church. Uh, and it has, as I said, that religious function. But it was a meeting place as well. Um, the Dalmatians, when they first were given this uh, charter, you could say, to establish their own official community uh, in Venice, they were um, rented this little piece of land where ultimately they built what you see here uh, from a neighboring monastery. The rent was yearly four pieces of gold, two loaves of bread, and a pound of wax. So clearly the wax had, had some value. And the uh, uh, bread was to be given to the neighboring mon monastery on the feast day of St. St. George. So remember, uh, you know, you walk around any place in Italy, the saints are everywhere. Uh, these uh, uh, churches are everywhere. Every guild, every, uh, every, every for example, the artists uh, in the Spice Guild, uh, leather tanners, any imaginable uh, guild of workers had their patron saint and so on. So this was a, a, a part and parcel of the daily life. And as we'll see, the, the literature, the, the stories of Christianity, the lives of the saints is, is, a, is an enormous part of that uh, um, cultural fabric. It's, it's, it's like trading cards today of sports heroes. It was, it was common uh, knowledge for, for everybody. And we're going to learn a bit about these patron saints, St. George and St. Trifon specifically. So here's uh, the great uh, map from the very early, uh oh, sorry about it. somebody sent me an email. Um, a map uh, of Venice by Jacopo Barbaro, Barbari, about 1500. So this is pretty much the area. Can you see the, hopefully you can see that little yellow dot where I'm indicating, that's where the Dalmatian school is. You're probably familiar with St. Mark's Basilica. It's over here. The Rialto Bridge is in the middle of the Grand Canal. If you come to Venice today by train, you end, you, the train comes in over here, okay? So then we'll go a little closer. There it is a little closer. And then we go a little closer and there it is. And you can see it's fairly similar to what we just looked at in, in 1502, the building and the neighboring monastery. Alrighty, so now I'm gonna uh, move to our virtual visit. Let's see where that is, here it is. Hopefully this is gonna work okay. Okay, so far so good, everybody can hear me. We can't see it. All we see is your slide. So I think you have to reshare again because you're going to the, you're going from your PowerPoint to your to the internet share. Okay. Okay. So let me interrupt and redo it. How about now? Yes. Great. Yeah. Okay. I want to take a sip of water. Okay, so I have to move my little box with all you guys in it over to the side. So just to give you an idea of the outside, this is a, I produced this work, of course, with photographers and engineers and the 360 degree 
gives you just an idea of where we are. This section of Venice, not, not too far from St. Mark's Basilica. And uh, the facade right in that alley there is the entrance to the uh, uh, Maltese uh, monastery that I mentioned briefly. And then uh, the facade here. So this building is from the uh, very early 1500s. It's not the original building. They, 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 the earlier one that I, when they first had the charter, uh, was rebuilt about 50 years later. And the paintings we're now going to see were originally upstairs, and then they were moved downstairs sometime in the early 1500s. So let's go inside. Now, again, just let me give you a brief, uh, just give you an idea what you're looking at. Uh, just so you see, it's pretty small. I mean, this is like a large, a large American living room. Or in Italy, a very large living room. So that's, you see how many pews there are an altar, there's an upstairs, and there's a couple other small rooms. And then just to just so you get an idea what we're looking at, the series of paintings I'm going to be telling you about in a moment. And then this is where we entered. If you go too fast, you get vertigo. So you don't want to go too fast. And then a lovely wooden ceiling, pretty, pretty nicely detailed. You can see. So the nice thing about this kind of visit is uh, we get some context. You see where these paintings are. And of course, that's one of the great things about Italy uh, is so much of the art is, is still remains in, in their in, in intended locations. These were, like I said, these were upstairs originally, these, these panels, these paintings, but they were always uh, in this Dalmatian school. And they've been in the same location for the better part of you know, practically 500 years. So there are a series of paintings that show uh, different stories of different saints, the patron saints of the Dalmatians. And St. George perhaps is the most, most well-known. Uh, and we're gonna press on it. And now the link also for this, what we're looking at uh, is, is available online for anyone, anytime, if you, and, and uh, it, it's, uh, I put it in the, the um, chat links among the other links that I placed. And uh, besides the high definition um, paintings that we're gonna look at, there are videos. And if you choose the uh, English versions, you'll hear my voice overdubbing a great scholar, um, Augusto Gentile, who wrote probably the definitive book on these, and on these works and their symbolism. So uh, there are videos that you can watch. So a lot of the stuff that I'm gonna talk about, you can, you can actually see it for yourself and, and learn more in, in any time you want. And the, the link, as I said, is there. So what, what do we have here? First of all, uh, the uh, George slaying the dragon. Why is he slaying this dragon? What's the backstory? Well, take a close look, it's pretty gruesome. There's no shortage of corpses and uh, half-eaten uh, people. There's a woman and uh, rotting and putrefying pieces of bodies and so on. And they're they're really all over the place. There's a, it's even explicit as you see the the, the genitalia of these figures. Uh, and then there's even more over here. Now the story is of this city called Selene in Libya, and by Libya that just commonly meant Africa. Uh, where this dragon had come to in infest the, the lake next to the city. And it's putrid, it, 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 it stinks, it's terrifying, and uh, you, can, you can get the idea when you look at it here. Um, and it demands, uh, in order not to, 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 eat, to destroy the city, uh, to, to have sacrifice. And so every day the, the, the people of the city are sacrificing their sheep, and ultimately, uh, naturally, they're young virgins. And uh, you only have so many sheep and young virgins, and ultimately it comes to be the, the turn of the king. And of course, the king has his fair princess daughter, and now she is to be sacrificed. And uh, with great uh, 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 suffering, the king uh, submits to the angry demands of the people, and, and she's going to literally be thrown to the dragon. And uh, like so many of these heroic stories, what happens? Well, right in time, the knight in shining armor shows up. 
Interestingly, though, uh, and uh, I, I failed to mention the, the source of the story. The story that I'm recounting comes from what's called the golden legend. And by legend, we don't, not our, not our modern uh, understanding of the word. Legend comes from to read. These were stories that were read. Uh, they'd be read daily, and there's a different saint for every every day of the year in the in the in the uh, in the calendar, right? There's a saint day, and then there's many many more. So uh, these, as I said earlier, these stories of these saints were very popular, and the Golden Legend was one of the most reprinted, most vastly distributed books of its time. And it had first been uh, published uh, in, by Jacobo da Voragine, that's his, the name of the writer, in the 1200s. He probably was as much a compiler as a writer. Uh, so these stories were famous. They were told again and again. They were popular. And the story that we're looking at and that I'm telling you is, is, is that is the source. And that's obviously the source for Carpaccio. So when I go into these details, it's from the Golden Legend, which again, you can find free versions of it online and, and of course published versions as well. So as, as I was saying, closing that parenthesis, just in time the uh, hero arrives and he is not any, just any hero, he's a Christian hero and he has this golden flowing hair. This is the the purity, the, the gold of, 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 of God you could say. It, it goes back to pre-Christian times, the, the power of the sun, so there's no coincidence there this golden idea. And uh, she does try to convince him to, uh, to not intervene because this dragon is so deadly. And uh, he, she tries to convince him to, to go his own way. But then he, he, of course, ignores her pleas and he faces the dragon. Now, another interesting little bit of symbolism, the, the massive, uh, 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 I'm having a lapsus, it's not called a spear, or pike, uh, the, the uh, the joust, jousting. You can see there's very much a, a Christ, a cross-like uh, form to it, right? And that's no coincidence either, n n nor here either. I mean, and, and uh, I'll take this little moment just to uh, parentheses regarding the detail. I mean, this is one of the wonderful things about Carpaccio, the, this, this, this mania for really uh, accurate kind of details, the shimmer of the of the uh, of the of the armor, um, and uh, e even the horse's bridle. See this kind of thing, um, and of course we're in. This is still before Michelangelo. I mean, Michelangelo will be a, a, a different kind of style, but the Renaissance really you could we can consider it beginning in the in the almost a century before this. Uh, so it's a long process. So this is what I suppose we could call the Venetian Renaissance period. But the sophistication of Carpaccio, he's in a long line of, of other significant artists of, of that time as well with this kind of sophistication and realism. Um, so, uh, sorry, I interrupted the story a bit. Um, but anyway, he does uh, willingly battle the dragon. And of course, we see this quite violent um, destruction of it, although he's not actually being killed. You see the, 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 the wood is snapping here. Now, um, regarding this kind of Christian version of the hero's tale, there's a, there's a purity to it, uh, a virginity to it. Uh, there isn't going to be a hero that gets the girl and rides off into the sunset in that way. It's not consummated, consummated with the, you know, the, um, you know, uh, marriage in that sense. And perhaps the uh, less pure, uh, uh, attempts had been made earlier, and it's because you, you you can't help but notice these are to some to some extent uh, sexualized uh, cadavers. So, of course, the idea of sexuality uh, as a temptation that block that that would get in the way of spirituality. Well, uh, this kind of hero, he's overcome those those uh, obstacles. Right um, now, another little parenthesis, but it's an interesting one. Notice uh, the realism of these. Uh, schooners, right? 1502, this is, what is it, almost 20 years after the discovery of, as I said, of uh, beyond Columbus and the circumnavigation of, of the globe in that period. And it was um, an attempt of the Venetians to compete with those new sea routes by building much faster uh, boats. And we see examples of that here for their trade. And another particularity regarding the execution of the paintings, what what are they made on? These are these are canvas. Well, all you have to do is look at a painting like this, uh, uh, an image like that, and you can get an idea. 
they had a lot of canvas available in Venice because it was a shipbuilding place. And it's very humid. It's not a good place to paint directly on the wall as one would do with fresco. So canvas paintings uh, are what you find uh, for the most part in Venice. So it's a reminder to us how much the context, the economic, the cultural, the geographic context dictates what, what is going to uh, take place uh, on a, even on a creative level. He's using canvas because there's a lot of canvas available. He's using canvas because frescoes are not practicable in the middle of a swamp when frescoes need to dry relatively quickly. Uh, so it's just a little bit of that kind of background. And another thing, these, these amazing details of this architecture. Um, there is some debate that uh, Carpaccio did a lot of traveling. How else could he have such a wide palette of, 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 of imagery but that's not necessarily uh, uh, necessary, uh, as you'll see. And uh, very exotic figures sometimes you'll see. And you can see some even here. You see Eastern style figures. Remember the present in the mind of everybody was the Turkish uh, threat. And the dragon doesn't just represent sin or gluttony and those kinds of extravagant things. There was a real there was a, almost a, a real kind of dragon. And so uh, I want to again uh, interrupt here briefly this part of the presentation and go back to uh, the PowerPoint to show you very quickly something. And I've got to just skip back ahead here. Uh oh, I was going, sorry, I was going the wrong way. Now, this is uh, a capture image from The Adventures of Baron von Munchausen, uh, Terry Gilliam's film from 1988. If you've never seen it, it's, it's wonderful. It's based on the, the, the fantasy adventures, which are uh, really a, a German fairy tale, where he is the favorite of uh, the queen, uh, the empress of uh, Austria, and he, uh, he has these battles with the Turks. And so what they recreated here in Ter Terry Gilliam's film, I know it's a little hard to make out, but you can see these monstrous cannons, which have mouths. They're fierce and fiery, and they literally breathe fire. Um, so these kinds of uh, weapons were something the Venetians were facing. So a dragon has a, has a, uh, a meaning for them, which is far beyond uh, not only mythological, but, but they were practically a real thing and they caused some serious death and destruction. Um, so he captured it well in this recreation, the film, of course, they made this film in, in Italy, but there are woodcuts and other versions, but this was the most vivid version. So that's why I wanted to show it to you. The, so it's a recreation, obviously. Now back to our, uh, okay, you can see it again. You can see what we're, we're back to the, Okay, good. All right. So the dragon has a lot of levels of significance. Okay. So back to our story, he hasn't killed the dragon, but he has defeated it, right? And now the next scene, we're going to the town of Selene where he's going to be feted. But there is a catch, as you'll see. So here we go now to the second one where he is going to slay the dragon. So the dragon is supine now. It almost looks, it's pitiful really. Uh, and he is about to give it the coup de grace. Um, but this was not something he did uh, just out of the goodness of his heart. He had, a, he had made, the, made an agreement with the, with the Selenites that he would kill the dragon if they converted to Christianity. So they are all going to convert now to Christianity. And through his pure heart and bravery, saving the girl, destroying this symbol of evil, he has uh, upheld his part of the bargain. And look at what he's holding it with. It's just a red sash. And this is, again, in the, in the story as uh, the golden legend tells it. He asked for the sash of the young princess, and she tied it around the neck of this now defeated dragon, and they led it into the town in that way. So there's an interesting, uh, you could read into that a, a great deal, the power, the, the, the power of, uh, of the woman is part of his domination of the monster. And here they are, the king, the queen, and his daughter. 
on horseback, the king and the queen. And detail-wise, this kind of fabric, of course, is a luxury item of Venice and, and perhaps even more famously uh, Florence, this kind of uh, rich, rich fabric, gilded fabric and so on. Uh, so again, that, that uh, uh, passion for detail. And here is his daughter. And she may end up being a little disappointed because the intention would be that the king is bringing her uh, to present her uh, really almost as a reward to uh, St. George um, for marriage, but he won't marry her. He'll ask her instead to be baptized. Um, just a little bit of the details, uh, the musicians fetting an African amongst them. Venice is a empire, a republic, a, a, a port uh, of international uh, importance. So of course you'd have people from everywhere in, in such a place. And uh, these are clearly Ottomans, meaning these are these are Turks. This is the this is the, the dress of aristocratic Turkish elite. So uh, again, through uh, that uh, constant uh, exchange, culture exchange, and of course the wars and all these things, uh, and of course the, the commercial, uh, these images and, and these people would have been um, been there for him for Caparcio to see. I mean, and then just little details like this, carpets decorating the, the balcony, more of these figures uh, witnessing the scene in the town. And in the middle, a gracious building, which looks a lot like the, the um, Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. Now, this is the kind of thing that leads people to say, well, Carpaccio must have traveled because this is just a, an extremely uh, faithful, very close to, to what it looked like. But that's not necessarily so that he, he uh, traveled. And, and I'm going to show you why right now. So again, I need to interrupt this briefly. And let me go back now to here. Um, just less than 20 years earlier, um, there, oops, excuse me. Oop, I meant to just show this. Uh, travels to Jerusalem, there was a famous uh, series of woodcuts in a book. It was, it was one of the first kind of international travel books, you could say. Um, the um, woodcutter's name, I can't remember it just exactly because I, I should have written it down. It's, it's Roy Cart or Roy Roof Cart. It's something Dutch. I'm sorry, I don't, I'll have to look it up. Uh, I, I just slips, but but nonetheless, this was a very popular book that was reprinted many times with these woodcuts. And here, of course, you can. What do we see? The Dome of the Rock, right there. So that's just as likely what uh, Car Carpaccio was using for his model. So this is a, a a very popular book of that time, and so you can see there's there's clearly a, a, a some uh, connection there, or or it's certainly not unrealistic to think that there would be. Okay, so now let me again close that. And uh, make sure you guys can see me again. Okay, all right. Okay, so we're back. Everybody can see once again the painting. Okay, so Carpaccio, or rather St. George has defeated the dragon. The people have celebrated. more of these amazing, richly detailed brocades of these wealthy aristocrats, but Turkish almost. And now the final episode, right here next to the little altar, the baptism. I have to move that, okay. And uh, Apparently, uh, St. George doesn't want to get his cloak wet. He's holding it towards him, and he's now uh, uh, pouring a little water on the king's head. And here is the daughter, the, the princess, being um, baptized. This is her nursemaid. So what would have been her nursemaid as a child becomes her lading and waiting, and then the queen as well. And notice here, one of these uh, figures 
presumably a Turk. And here you have the idea of the Christian, um, the force of the Christian religion and the idea of uh, converting the infidel. These figures here have, uh, they're, 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 they're on their knees and they're waiting their turn. They're going to be baptized too. And uh, there's, their, uh, there's his uh, turban, which has been taken off. Others, though, not so sure. They're not, uh, they may or may not. I mean, there's that, that little bit of that doubt. And then this wonderful uh, musicians, again, that celebratory aspect. And then a couple things, uh, particularly in this painting that I, that I really like, that just are these details, these, these Turks. This one, I just love this guy. It's almost a caricature. Look at this long, long beard and this incredible <coughs> turban he's got on. But uh, they're just interesting to me. Yeah. So clearly this was a striking style um, and, and very different than what the Venetians would wear, as far as I know, they don't, they don't wear turbans. And then uh, regarding just a bit of the symbolism, there's a dog, uh, faith, loyalty, and nothing but the tiniest little uh, uh, step on top of his leash. What remains of the uh, Carpaccio's signature? And these are all believed, uh, the date somewhere is, uh, is believed uh, about 1502. And then uh, other sources of, uh, uh, of um, the history and symbolism, the parrot can talk. And a parrot, uh, when the emperor walked by one day, the Roman emperor, he said, Ave Cesare, hail Caesar. Ave will become another god, you could say, Ave or goddess, in this case, Ave Maria, Hail Mary. So, now we've um, concluded the story of St. George. So he won't marry the girl, he rides off into the sunset, he will be martyred, as you probably know most saints are. Now, over here we have St. Tryphon, and there's just one panel. Um, Tryphon is a, a child. Uh, so here's this idea of the, the purity of a child and a saint, and he is an exorcist. That's what this hideous monster is. Merely the presence of the pure, saintly child is all that is necessary to exorcise this demon from his daughter, who is here, her hands in prayer. So what is the, the nature of the demon? The, the demon is hidden. What does the exorcist do? The exorcist renders it visible. When it's visible, when it's named, now it can be defeated. And the demon is shifty, it's, it's, it changes, it's, it, it's, um, it's, it's, it's grotesque and it can be anything. So those, of course, are, you know, ideas that can be translated into, you know, you name, name the person, name your demon, gambling, alcohol, ugly monsters. I mean, there's, there's, there's a ne never ending combination of ugly demons that we have to affront, but getting them out and naming them makes them defeatable. And that's what we see has happened. The appearance of Trifon has, has exercised, excuse me, ex well, I guess it would be exercised or excised from the uh, daughter of the Emperor Gordian, this uh, demon. Now, this is probably an apocryphal story. There's, there's no, you know, although Trifon is, uh, is again, venerated to this day, and, and there's churches dedicated to him, and he has a saint day. And, uh, but back to the demon, it's got all kinds of different, you know, bits of different animals and so on. It's quite ugly. But it's interesting. It's just the mere appearance of the child uh, exercises the demon from the daughter of the emperor. Here too, a couple little grace notes that I just I just uh, uh, like very much. The the ladies observing the scene with the the rugs uh, decorating the windows. This one, as you can see, was was restored at some point or or damaged, uh, damaged or restored during its long history. And then same thing over here the ladies on the balcony. So that's the story of St. Trifon. Now, 
these la these two are episodes from the from the uh, gospels. Those you can check out uh, through the link anytime you want. But we're gonna. I think that the way the time is going, this is working out well. We're going to do the story now of St. Jerome. So St. Jerome uh, is not named uh, as in a dedication to the school, School of Trifon and, and St. George, but St. Jerome is one of the most important saints, one of the fathers of the, of the church, the translator uh, of the, 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 the Bible into Latin. Uh, uh, the Latin Bible that he produces will be the definitive Bible for uh, so much of the history of the church uh, in well into the Middle Ages. And uh, he was a, a native of, of Dalmatia uh, and a, um, a severe monk as well in the sense of austere. So uh, it's an interesting story. His uh, symbol is the lion. And this story again, we're uh, at the, with the golden legend. Uh, the, the lion appears at this monastery scaring off the uh, other monks. And you see they are very much hoofing it. So there's a, a, a fair bit of motion there. It's an unusual figure. The leg there, uh, Augusto Gentili, who uh, I'm taking a lot of what I'm telling you from, and it, it seems to me reasonable that, that that's a wooden leg because it, it's so strange looking. It looks like it's probably a wooden leg and he wouldn't be the only uh, handicapped person. In fact, you can see back here, another very old monk hobbling along, right? So scaring away a deer and a pheasant and these uh, terrified uh, monks, but not St. Jerome. And in fact, St. Jerome holds his ground. And what does he discover but that the paw, this is a lion in severe pain. And in his paw is a horrible pussy uh, a splinter, which he will remove. And that lion will be his faithful friend and follow him around to the end of his days. So the lion is placed in the symb symbolism next to this great scholarly monk. Um, and uh, that idea of force, that idea of courage, but also you could say on an intellectual level uh, represents him. And again, I want to just step out of this and show you another example that's a little more recent. So I need to just briefly go back to the PowerPoint. And here you have one of the two famous iconic lines of the New York Public Library Edward Clark Potter was the sculptor, 1911. And what are their names? Patience and fortitude. So again, those are the kind of virtues that we would imagine a saint would have as well. And not unsurprisingly, where are they? In front of a temple of scholarship, a temple of learning. Okay. So uh, these symbols, uh, again and again, that's why it's so, I think, yeah, worthwhile to delve in because they're everywhere. Okay, back to the saint. Now, uh, regarding the place we're at, this is a reasonable recreation, it's believed, of, of what a monastery in Venice at that time would have looked like. And remember, Venice is a series of islands. Uh, so um, parts of some of these 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 monasteries still still stand. There are some on on distant islands. There's one, um, uh, an Armenian one that's still actually active. Um, others have been like as I said, studying there. Some of the important faculties are in uh, 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 converted monasteries. Uh, the quantity of monasteries and convents and the number of people that must have lived there reminds us of how how again fundamental and central the, 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 the religious life was to the economy and the, the culture and the spiritual life of the society. So uh, we see uh, parts of this monastery. This appears to be the main church and there's some paintings on the outside. So that's a documentation that would tell us something about the exterior of some of these, these, these churches at that time with, the, with uh, images on, this, on, on them. And if they were frescoed or painted, of course, they've, they've long since worn away. So 
the lion has become Jerome's faithful friend. And now let us go to the next episode. And they actually put the lion to work. He has to, this again is in the golden legend. He has to accompany a mule who goes to uh, uh, gather firewood every day until one day the mule is stolen and then the lion comes back and everybody thinks the, that the lion ate the mule um, until the, the, the lion actually goes out and searches for the mule and brings him back. And now here is the death of uh, Jerome. So his body's been laid out. Interestingly, he appears to be wearing the monk reading from the reading, uh, the last readings. They're all holding candles. And here is believed, this figure with the pronounced nose, this is believed to be a portrait of, of Cardinal Bessarion. And I told you Carlo Bessarion was so fundamental, such a fundamental part of this period of the Renaissance, bringing teaching Greek and um, um, uh, di divulging uh, that knowledge and, and the text and so on. Um, and in fact, the donation of, of his books um, became the mo most important uh, library in Venice. It's called the, the, the Marciana, Marciana St. Mark's Library, and its original donation were, were the books of Bessarione. This clearly is a is a portrait too, probably perhaps an important patron of the, the Dalmatians. I don't, I don't believe it's known. And in this uh, fount of holy water, there is a piece of a skeleton, that idea of austerity, abnegation, um, renunciation is always a, a part of the, the monk's life and uh, so on. And there is the, uh, the mule, so he had obviously survived. I told you about from this story. Now, interestingly, if we take a step back, we're looking at the same monastery from the opposite uh, direction. We were over there where those people are, and now we're on the opposite end looking back. So there's an interesting uh, flipping of the, the space. So it's that same compound. And then over here is the lion uh, giving out a roar, and perhaps this is a roar of, of grief his master uh, is deceased. And uh, interestingly here, conversations going on, dialogue. In 1503, there approximately peace, there was a peace treaty with Bayezid, the Sultan, and uh, the wars with the Turks for the moment were, were ended. So from warfare to peace, uh, could have something to do with the fact that there are some Turks in a, in a, in a monastery. Now, the last painting, and um, one of the most famous, it was for a long time called St. Jerome in his studio because St. Jerome is often, um, there's wonderful paintings, many of St. Jerome in his studio, that whole idea of being a scholar, St. Jerome accompanied not by a pooch, but St. Jerome accompanied by a lion. But a, uh, an American scholar, uh, through research and the finding of a very uh, uh, rare manuscript found a different story. And that story was about St. Augustine. And Augustine was a contemporary of Jerome. And here we have St. Augustine in his studio. And in this story, what it relates is that pondering um, the spiritual matters, he was at an impasse. And this was the moment that we saw in the previous painting when Jerome breathed his last. And at that moment, what's happening? A bright light shines through the window. And notice there's candle holders. There's no light. There's no artificial light. The light is spiritual light. And that spiritual light is a visitation. It's a visitation from Jerome, inspiring and consoling St. Augustine. So 
that's realistically who, who this is. And it may be a, a, a uh, portrait as well of an important sponsor of the Dalmatians, flattering a, an important donor perhaps. And uh, we see important uh, 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 examples of this, uh, the Bishop's Mitre, staff, and a seashell which relates a story uh, of August Augustine uh, where he saw a child on a beach uh, trying to take a shell and, and take water out of the sea. And he's like, you, you think you're going to take all of the, the water out of the ocean? And the child, God speaking to the child, said, and you think you're going to understand uh, the works of God? It was a little uh, remonstrance uh, to him to be a little more humble the bell too, to call his servants, and some interesting things regarding the science. This is what's called the armillary sphere. So these are the heavens. It's not astrology, but it is uh, the, 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 the wisdom and intelligence of God as it works through uh, the functioning, the clockwork, I suppose you could say, of the universe. And there's a kind of an altar here with a, a Christ, of course, the flag with uh, St. George's, um, flag, uh, the Christ here, this is uh, the Christ uh, resurrected. So that's would go definitely with this idea of the resurrected soul of Jerome. And then uh, a beautiful uh, recreation of a, of a mosaic, the kind that were that are, of course, to be seen in uh, St. Mark's Basilica it was so wonderful, not an angel, a seraphim, what is a seraphim, a bunch of wings with a head. So it's a there's a lot more kinds of angels than just the angels that we think, and that one's called a seraphim. And uh, in this back room, a lot more astronomical uh, instruments and a reading table. So this uh, idea of the scientific uh, interest is present. And what would be a, an absolutely vast library. And an interest for the antique. Clearly, uh, this would be uh, you see here a little bronze. These are the kind of votive figures that were collected and uh, passed around objects from ancient Rome that of course were, were very, would have been very popular um, for intellectuals and uh, men of culture and so on. Those kind of things would have, were, were being medallions, coins, uh, manuscripts. That was the passion of the Renaissance, collecting those artifacts of antiquity translating them, and then uh, a bishop's chair, specifically a, a Venetian style one for, for prayer. And a dog again, faith, loyalty, companionship. Uh, interestingly, uh, the music that you see down here has been transcribed. I think you can find examples of it uh, on, on YouTube. I didn't, I didn't think to uh, link that though, but it's out there. Time keeps passing, so make the most of it. Write your friends. That's my little symbolism. And um, with that, it's the witching hour. So um, I pretty much covered everything I, I, I intended to. And so uh, I hope you enjoyed that. And this, obviously, it's a, any, any questions, if anyone has, this is, this is I guess, the moment. If you have a question, uh, just go ahead and unmute and you can ask. Uh, I'll just let you ask yourself. Hi, Jason and everybody. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, I guess you somewhat answered the question near the end, Jason, that I was going to ask about the, about the dogs, faith, loyalty. Um, I noticed the, and you pointed out the very stolid and dignified looking dog in the, um, one of the earlier stories, um, with the baptism of the daughter mm -hmm. and the, uh, of the King, um, was that common, uh, with Boccaccio, Bo Bo Boccaccio, uh, painting a, a dog in certain, um, pieces of artwork or other artists of that, of that time to represent, uh, faith and, and loyalty, et cetera? 
Well, sure. And not only, there could also be negative connotations to dogs too. It just depends, you know, mm. um, the, 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 the symbolism that one can read into the various things. It's oftentimes, uh, it's, it's, sometimes it's more narrow, sometimes it's more wide open, but mm. in that specific case with the, the, uh, um, the leash barely being held, it seems to imply steadfast faith. And then the other one, of course, is, is very sweet with him just looking at the little terrier type. Um, but it, it depends. Uh, Maestro De Luca, who's uh, with us, uh, in his uh, work restoring the Sistine Chapel, and this is one of the things that comes up in, in his book that, that you'll be able to read in English next year when it comes out, uh, is this little dog appears in many of the paintings in the Sistine yeah. Chapel. And it it was probably the mascot of the gang of painters who were there. Uh, and he's he's hopping around and jumping around in, a, in, in several scenes. So, uh, you know, what, what can you say? Uh, man's best friend. And there's a smile. And it's mm -hmm. a smile. Uh, Jason, I had a question. I, I thought it was interesting, the St. George, the series of the St. George paintings. Um, the Virgin uh, Princess had a red cloak on in the first two, and then you mentioned in the last one, and I saw that St. George had the red cloak on, and she does not have the red cloak on for her baptism. It seems like she's actually given her red cloak to St. George. And I'm just wondering if there was some symbolism maybe involved in that at, at the moment of her baptism. She now, he has her cloak. He doesn't have her, but he has her cloak. Yeah, well, I think you just did it for us. I th thanks. <laughs> <laughs> that That's a good observation. I, I, I had, I think, subconsciously noticed it, but I'd never really thought about it, but that's absolutely true. And, you know, I, I think with that kind of thing, you go a little bit to the yin yang, the complementarity of male, female. Uh, there's something about that there. And perhaps the fact that it is the consummation, the baptism is the consummation with God, I guess you could say, uh, like the consummation between the man and the woman uh, in, in a sense. So that's a really a, a fantastic observation. I'll use that, thanks. So I had a question about the time. So um, the building is already there and then Carpaccio is, um, is what, what's the word when you're asked to paint? And hired. Hired to then paint um, the three, how, and okay, here, so the three saints. So how does, how would they have decided who their three saints would have been? Do you know? That's a good question. The saints generally, well, in this case, they they preceded the 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 artist in the sense that he he's commissioned uh, to do the work based on the fact that he was he was already a prestigious he was a well known artist and he also did you can see other schools in Venice where his work you know more ambitious much larger paintings some in their original locations some are in the museum such as the Academia. Uh, but uh, generally, the artist is is he, he he's taking a commission. There may there might be there's obviously some flexibility to what they and and how they're gonna show what they show. But if you're being paid and and they say we want this saint and this story, that's what that's obviously what the customer is expecting. And an important um, record for art historians are contracts which obviously not in every case, but there are many cases of contracts surviving. And the contracts could specify um, the, the time, that uh, the, the consignment time. And interestingly, and this, this, this um, again is something uh, from Maestro De Luca, who's here with us, the, the quality of the pigments, because these were expensive and the Venetians knew more than any, anyone because these pigments were, were oftentimes luxury imports. Lapis lazuli, a precious... Do, uh, maestros, maestro, go ahead. No. <laughs> I say even the gilding. The gold, yes. Yeah. 
The gold, the, the gold, if you the were going to use the price was, was a high. Gun. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And so they pay the artist more and the artist is expected to use such and such a quantity of gold, such and such a quantity of, yes, of lapis exactly. lazuli. Yeah, because San Carlos, these San Carlos became from far, far away. They came from far away and, and 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 extremely expensive, literally worth sometimes worth their weight in gold. From, from Afghanistan, from Turkey, and, and so on. <clears throat> Lapis lazuli quarried in the Himalaya, yeah. coming yeah. along the the Silk Roads to Acre to Constantinople, mm -hmm. then on on by ship all the way. By the time it gets to Rome, or rather to Italy, it's it's the the priciest and 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 one of the most prestigious paints. So if you see a lot of lapis lazuli, this is in fact what you see in Michelangelo's Last Judgment. Is that not correct? There's and some it, lapis lazuli. And the Italian right just in Venice with the ships. Venice was the marketplace. One of the important, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Marco so, Polo. <laughs> yeah, Marco Polo was a Venetian. So uh, the, 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 those contracts tell us a lot about the 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 history of the paintings when they're available. You know, it's just part of it's it's all puzzles for for that kind of scholarship, which is definitely not my my uh, uh, forte at all. But the great great scholars who you know you can imagine studying it, it, art in Rome. I, I I've studied under them and known some of them. People who you know slave away and find strange documents and things, the kind of things that Maurizio here, Maestro De Luca would have held in his own hands because the Vatican library, uh, that's of course a separate part of the Vatican because the Vatican like anywhere has its many different sections, but some of the most precious, most ancient, rarest manuscripts anywhere are in the Vatican libraries. Uh, a quick comment, Prof, on this, because I'm so excited I'm going to have to cut myself short. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to study abroad just after 9-11 tragedy in, in, in London. And I spent a short time in Italy, what, and I had to rush through it with my wife. And everything was push, push, push. And the, the strain of traveling made it just, even though we were passionate about all of it, it was too much to do. Because you're doing this, you make it available and it's not just because we're in a pandemic this makes it so that the fatigue of travel is not a factor to keep us from it you know we can just digest this as we will so i'm just extremely grateful and excited about this medium for us to look at this stuff now thank you very much for working that hard on it well thanks dean and uh this particular project that i've used today is the kind of thing that i i really i built it I produced it with the hope of, of uh, soliciting interest from, you know, I mean, somebody introduce me to Bill Gates, please. You know, <laughs> what, I'd like to, what I'd like to see is these kinds of models of every church in Venice, not to mention b b anywhere, because uh, it's not just a, it, it's a, it's a learning resource and it's for, for people who are curious and it's for students, it's for, uh, anybody who wants to take a look. And, and the nice thing is, as you saw, is uh, that old fashioned way of reading a text and then flipping to the back of the book to look at the photos. We're grateful for, for printed material. Uh, but the fact that, that, that this kind of digital visit can give you a, a context as well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an added, it's a nice thing, I think. So that, that's the idea that you know where you are, you've seen the building, you, you, you have a a very uh, a, 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 an, let's just say an enhanced understanding of, of what this is. is really cheap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can you know, anytime you can when you can come. It's it'll be there in those places. So these kinds of uh, 360 degree panoramas and stuff. There are, I mean, I haven't done anything. No one's reinvented the wheel here. There are um, there are 300. There's 360. You know panoramas of, of a lot of things. Even on the Vatican site, they've got one of the Sistine Chapel, but it's limited. It's just you can turn around in it, but but there's none of that interactivity. Uh, but in any event, um, hey Jason, there's a question from Charlie and Karen Julian. They're wondering how does the Dalmatian school relate to the northern coast of old Yugoslavia? 
Well, it, it relates specifically because Dalmatia, that is Dalmatia, uh, the, all those islands, um, modern day Croatia. So uh, the Dalmatian area, because of its proximity to Venice and as Venice expanded and Venice, as we said, was a, was a, was a, a, a maritime republic, it, it, its lifeblood was trade. That means pirates are a no-no. And that meant that they, as they expanded their trade, they, they conquered areas as necessary. They, they built outposts. If you go back to Othello, what is Othello? He's a, he's a marshal of the, 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 the Venetian Navy uh, fighting in Cyprus to ensure that their bases remain um, uh, intact uh, to ensure their trade and so on. So uh, the Dalmatians were a, were a hardy people and like any um, um, uh, growing e economic uh, reality, it attracts, it's gonna attract uh, 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 people to work in any, in any imaginable uh, way. And the Dalmatians were tough sailors. So they uh, became sailors on those ships, among other things. The whole K, that's to say the, 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 the what do you call it? The docking area, all uh, right along the the water there, is called the 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 fundamento de, de le schiavi. I'm kind of paraphrasing, but it's it's called for the for the sla for the sla slaves, but meaning the Slavics, because there were so many of them, and that was their that was their place where they'd probably pass by and see their friends and exchange information and they paid their dues they had their they had their religious ceremonies their their saint days that that was where their um tribe so to speak uh had its uh reference point so but but they were relate they are those dalmatians and their descendants are venetians to this day and uh they're still there could I ask a question? Yes, sure. ma'am. I'm interested in the selection of the um, scenes from the life of St. George. You know, they, yeah. they are portraying him obviously at the, you know, at the peak of victory. But, you know, there are other cycles of the life of St. George that emphasize his martyrdom. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. there's some famous and really bloody gory ones. and. So it just struck me that would this have been a decision by Carpaccio to sort of suggest the triumphal aspects of, and also the, the young saint, you know, that was Trifon. probably a great moment in Trifon's life, mm -hmm. rather than, mm -hmm. you know, some churches weighed in very heavily for the martyrdom thing. Mm -hmm. And is this maybe a, I don't know if this is Renaissance as opposed to medieval, which I'm more used to, or, mm -hmm. um, a choice that Carpaccio or his patrons would have made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, a, a great observation. Um, it's probably more likely that it's the patron's choice than the artist's because that's very specific, choosing which moments and choosing moments of triumph as opposed to moments of abnegation or suffering uh could have but i just i, I mean I, I can't i don't know but i would say like for example since we're talking about a lay population these are sailors and stuff after a hard day rowing you probably don't want to go yeah. see a guy being boiled in oil uh yeah. as opposed to a guy overcoming his obstacles so so there's there's <clears throat> perhaps something has something to do with that the 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 role of that particular church and the role it played for its community as a gathering place. Imagine another church that might be a place where you have penitents or, or you know, that kind of thing where they're, they're fasting a lot and doing all of that, where it might be a very different clientele, so to speak. Um, then you might have more of that kind of um, overcoming suffering. Uh, so, so it could have something to do with that. And it could have something to do with the historical moment. It could have to do with the zeitgeist. I, 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 I've been dipping into Spengler, trying to understand Spengler's decline of the West. And he's all about zeitgeist, where, where cultures manifest their, their phases of growth uh, and also decay. So a period where there's a shared optimism, that's gonna be 
you know, reasonably uh, transmitted in the, in the art. And then, you know, a period of nihilism, not so much and so on. So uh, there's no good answer. As far as like art historians, they'd say, well, is there a document where somebody specifically requested something? If there is, then you could say, okay, somebody specifically demanded this. But if it's not, then as we've just done, we, we speculate, reasonable speculation. Thanks. Sure, well, thanks for the observation. I'm uh, curious about something. Yes, ma'am. Um, I see the dog in the baptism painting portrayed in a positive light. In the Muslim world that I'm familiar with, dogs are very negative. Dogs are not, they're not symbols of faithfulness and love, they are, they are despised. So I'm wondering, is that a difference perhaps in the Turkish part of the Muslim world or is it, is it meant to provide a contrast where the dog becomes positive when this city is being baptized? So I just I don't I don't know about that part of the Muslim world. I just the part of the Muslim world I'm familiar with. Dogs mm -hmm. are not. Uh, yeah, I don't uh, I don't have enough. Uh, I don't know enough. I mean, I, I did actually live in, in in Istanbul many years ago, and uh, uh, I, I, I but I don't have I don't have an opinion on 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 their interest in dogs one way or, or the other. Um, but um, the one contrast I would say that's visible and real is there's that we go from a, a nasty dragon to the dragon slain to a parrot and a dog, the parrot who literally can say Hail Mary and the dog who barely needs to be, there's a, and again, there's another little connection there, the leash before there was the, the ribbon of the, the sash of the, of the of the uh, uh, of the princess, and now there's just barely a leash being held. So uh, probably there's that idea of uh, dominating and overcoming personal uh, demons and domesticating oneself, just like uh, uh, it, yeah, it could also be considered domesticating or conquering the Turks or conquering your own your own demons, and then having them under control. So the dog is now. Through, through, through the grace of God and baptism and Christ, those demons become an obedient dog that barely needs to be held on a leash. And, and that's a nice message because there is that idea of, of the power of the power of, uh, of Christ and, and uh, that empowers us. So the reason that that leash is not so necessary is because we have the power and the grace of, of, of God once we've submitted through baptism, I would say that the re that's a reasonable reading. But Jason, there are Dominicani. Dominicani. Ah, ma uh, Professor uh, Maestro De Luca has made an excellent uh, observation. The Dominicans, the Dominicans, which we think of it just as the Dominicans, right? The Dominican Republic, the Dominicans as a, like, like uh, the Jesuits and so on. What does that mean? Dominicani literally means conquering or dominating the dog. Dominating the dog. So the Dominicans. Cani, cioè servitori del Signore, Domini Cani. Okay, so it means instead servants. Okay, dogs, dogs of God. Would that be more correct? Dogs yeah. of God, meaning totally obedient to God. Obedient to fidelity. Yeah. So submitting themselves and, and, and uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Goodbye, Andrea. Andrea Vanucci left us. I, 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 just one thing. May I? Yes, of course, Maestro. Uh, did you try to um, interpret the sheet of music? The sheet of music, there are, um, there are uh, studies. Five lines. Five lines. It's a, a, um, quite modern music. Um, on the contrary of the Gregorian music, four lines. It's very interesting because uh, it's a, a terminus antequem or postquem. What does that mean, postquem? For the date. 
Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. The okay. I understand what you're saying. He's saying yeah. that the from, fact that it's the, five lines. Fifteenth century on, from from the uh, fifteenth century on, the five lines for the sheet music. Right. So five line sheet music. So it shows us the before. It it it, it, it makes it places us historically I, at that time, and um, I can't. Do that. I'm not. I you know since I don't I don't read music. Um, I, I have no no expertise, but I do know that and I, because when I did that kind of research, the, the 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 articles there are scholars that have done articles specifically on I, the music in, in those. In, I'm interested in music, and uh, I noticed that. Yeah, yeah, that music that music has been played. It, you can I think you can find you can find it probably on YouTube. And articles about it, like I said, have been, have been, so it's been, you know, people have looked into it. For example, in Sistine Chapel, we, we found the, the, um, the signature of um, Jusquin de Pré, c'est le uh, Kappelmeister. Um, and, the choir uh, master. And, uh, and uh, Professor Pichemann um, interpreted it. Um, signature and music scratched on the surface of the fresco. Music written on the fresco. So here you have a reminder, you know, we look at the paintings, you can look at the history, and then of course there's the music and the, the food and the, uh, the warfare and the money. Yeah. So, so many different levels uh, and, and different approaches that, that, that make up a, a civilization, which are all, you could say, uh, you know, interlocking. Um, it, I want to just remind everybody uh, as we approach the end that, the, uh, that on the chat uh, at the very beginning, I put links. So in those links, you'll find the um, yeah, uh, yeah. link to the Dalmatian visit, the virtual visit that I've used today. You'll find uh, a link to a, a, a book if you're interested. Um, uh, it's called, uh, it's the history of Venice by John Julius Norwich. If you're interested in history, it's a nice, very, he's a great, great historian of the history of Venice. I put the, the link through uh, bookshop.com and uh, there's the link to the uh, Google map of Venice, of Carpaccio and Venice, which I built, which is a very easy thing. You can, anybody, you can build a map of anything you want and pick places. So you can look at that if you're curious to check out all the various places in Venice where his work is. I, I, I don't have I just, any of what you speak of. I think it could be that either I wasn't in or it was enabled at the time or whatever. Yeah, it was but because, we, yeah. I, I, you so you later on it, right? I well, just, I, can, I can put it back on again, but I, I just assume that you could just scroll up no, in the chat and find not it. If, not, not if you don't have it. If you come in later or oh, for whatever okay. reason it doesn't right. happen, okay. then, it, then the then pre-stuff doesn't get access. Okay. Okay. Well, right right now, as soon as uh, as soon as we start to wrap up, I'll just I'll just copy and paste it on again. So yeah, anyway, yeah. what I'll, what I'll copy and paste on is the the virtual link. Uh, the link to the the book by Norwich, if you if you're interested in that, the link to the Google Map of Carpaccio. Um, I think I think that's it. Uh, I think there's just those three things. Okay, it's almost six thirty. Any any last couple questions? One more question from uh, Charlie and Karen again. How does the story of Saint Jerome and the thorn in the lion's paw relate to Androlocles and the lion? I don't know. I don't know who Androlocles is. That's not a, that's not something I'm familiar with. Did I Do you say know, that? Holly? I don't know. Greek or Roman myth, um, Charlie or or Karen? I'm sorry. What? It's a Greek or Roman myth about a, a god and a lion. No, it's about Androcles and the lion. It's it's a story that I that I've always heard, and it's been reproduced in in. Um, I, don't, I can't. I can't remember what now. I know I've seen it in in plays and stuff. It's the story of Androcles and the lion, and Androcles is the one who's removing the, the thorn from the lion, which saves him from being eaten when he's when he's being sacked, martyred in the in the arenas of Rome. 
Oh, I see. Um, well, oh, there. Oh, well, there's also there's the there's the uh, early Christian uh, story. Uh, is it David amongst the lions? It's not, but it's not King David. Um, oh, that's one of those those early stories that was very popular with the early Christians, and there's paintings of it in the catacombs of uh, a, a, a saint in the among in the den of the lions, and and the lions won't eat him because of his faith in God. Um, yeah, there's definitely some. Con I would say that those are there's obviously echoes of that. I, I wish I could remember. I, can, I wish I could remember that. Ma Maestro, uh, ti, ri ti ricordi tra tra le leoni? Uh, do you Daniel remember? Nella fossa dei leoni. Daniel so it's Dan nella Daniel. I, yeah, Daniel. Okay, I was saying David, right? Daniel in the da Daniel in the lion's den. That's right. So he gets thrown in there, but it's faith of God protects him. So uh, grazie, Maestro. I'm gonna uh, let me grab these. Um, uh, um, thank you. While you're still on, uh, Professor Jason and or Holly, uh, Holly, you put a link in there that's a Google thing, and it looks like it requires a permission. That's no big deal, right? I just submit and and he gets permitted, so I can. Oh yeah, maybe so. I don't know. I haven't clicked document. But okay. um, if, if we're struggling with the links, I'll just have Jason email me, and then I'll send them out in a in the yeah. in an email. Sue has her hand raised. Uh, yes, I just, we hadn't heard from Andrew. Oh, hi, and, Andrew. Did you have anything? And, oh, I'm just a participant, Susanna. Was there anything in particular that you were, well, you you were thinking you, about? You were, uh, it looked like after Sherry's comment, you wanted to say something. You had. No, uh, I might have had a. I might, oh, thank you. I might have had a question at that time, but it's uh, no longer there. Thank you, <laughs> oh. though, <laughs> for the conscientiousness. I appreciate and, it. <laughs> Andrew, do you want to put a link to your podcast in the chat, also? Yeah, what I'll do. Okay, I'll I'll uh, type it up and and uh, yeah, I'll reference it for everybody. And it goes live in late late March on the major podcast uh, channels. But I'll type that up now. Okay. And you can send, I'm going to give you my email. Thank you, Holly. So. Okay. Um, so I, I, so do, so Holly, you took care of the, <clears throat> those links. You put them on there again. I don't need to do that. Right. I put them on again. Yeah. I'll okay. All righty. So, so I guess that's, that's, unless there's uh, any uh, last little questions. Um, it's, it's evening here. So it's getting to be uh it's getting to be the wit wit swell at 6 30, but Rocco's got to eat. My son's got to eat. So <laughs> thank you, Jason, yeah. so much for being here. You got hey, 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 hey. Yeah. hey, thank, thank you, you, everybody. Thank Wonderful. you, Jason. Um, so, cool. so interesting. Jason, I need your LinkedIn information because he would oh. like. Yeah, that's the other thing I'll put on. Let me do that. Just just bear with me one second and I'll do that right now. So then I'll just. Didn't... Click on it, or copy and paste it to a note, the LinkedIn, his LinkedIn um, profile, and then you can just uh, comment on that to give him some. Give me some uh, juice. Give him some juice. Thank you very much, Jason. Some, some mojo. Holly, you just put something else. You put a link on just recently on the chat. Is that right? Yeah, you're not getting it, Dean? No, I'm not. Let's go email later. Is that okay. could, good? Is that fair to push you like that? Sure, sure. Sue, okay. did you have another question, Sue, or was that? Oh, I just, I just wanted to thank him, and I hope this isn't the last of his uh, endeavors. That I mean, so many people will never be able to go in person to Venice, and this is quite an opportunity uh, for for all of us. Even I have been to Venice. I'm lucky enough to have been there, but I did did not get to visit the Dalmatian school and it's gorgeous. I appreciate the, uh, all the work you've done to put this together. Thanks, well, um, I'll, uh, you know, I was thinking maybe, uh, you know, in a perhaps uh, a, like a month from now we can do something else. Um, yeah. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll look into what would work best regarding some material. I have some ideas, my, my LinkedIn I put on there so anybody that wants to do like endorsement or whatever you do on, on LinkedIn, that's appreciated. 
And uh, yeah, uh, I would like I would like to do something else, especially because doing this through the church, you know, today and the last couple of days, I was doing exams with my professor where we were examining the students and and we were doing um, testing them on um, Cennino Cennini and Cennino Cennini wrote the what is considered the first modern how to book. It's really Maestro De Luca's uh, expertise, but the very, very first words the very first chapter is in the name of the holy trinity i mean it's just saturated with with the religious religiosity and i thought it'd be fun to read a little bit of it and then incorporate into that some of the paintings of that time that reflect chinini's writing obviously not something overly technical but but just a little bit to give you an idea so perhaps we could meet again a month from now and and do something else that would be fabulous uh, Maestro De Luca, uh, grazie, grazie. Uh, for being here. Oh. Thank you for being here with Molto us. Molto grazie. Grazie a voi. Thank you, Ciao, everybody. Ciao, Maestro. I'll, I'll Ciao. talk to you soon. Ciao. We're we're Ciao. we're in we're in uh, what you call alto mare. We're on the high seas <laughs> translate translating this book and. Uh, Basically, I do a few drafts and then I send it to the maestro and then we discuss it and we do all the little things and then finally send it to the Getty. So, but that's that's going pretty well. And uh, um, I don't know what their schedule is, but I would imagine that, you know, maybe I, I don't think it's unrealistic that the book will be out next Christmas. And uh, regarding the Getty, uh, in any event, on their website, they've got uh, a lot of great books, not only for sale, books that uh, once they're um, out of print, there are free PDFs of them. So if you have not, not specifically Renaissance, but all kinds of cool books, you can just download them. Um, I downloaded one about samurai swords and things like that. So, so it's a nice website to, to check out if you have that interest. Okay, well, thanks Bye -bye. everybody for being here. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Rocco, come and say goodbye. Rocco, come and say goodbye. Rocco, oh, we get to see Rocco. Rocco. Rocco's yeah. hungry. Rocco, ciao, Rocco. Ciao, Rocco. Ciao, Rocco. Lucas somewhere. All right, everybody. Well, we're gonna, we have to eat now. I have to feed. He's a hungry boy. He's got to eat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Ciao. 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 This is great, everyone. Uh, Bye. Thanks for coming. Thank thanks, uh, Andrew Thank and you. Maestro and everybody else. Uh, from the great. There might have been some people from the American University, too. I told them about it, but I, I didn't. I was too busy Hi. talking. Nice to meet you, Andrew. Yeah, nice meeting you, Holly. Bye, everybody. Okay. Bye. 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 Stay well, everybody. Have a great weekend. Okay, ciao. I'm going to hang up now, too. Bye. Bye. Bye.